came about during the Protestant Reformation when the Martin Luther, who uh, was forced out of the Catholic Church, he never intended to leave the Catholic Church, but he was forced out because he did not agree with the practices of the Catholic Church, particularly how much power the popes had. And in fact, that and we're not trying to turn anybody against the Catholics, this is, this is history. Um, that you can even look it up yourself if you do research. That the popes had so much power that the pope uh, preached uh, or the pope um, made a rule that was enforced in the Catholic Church in that day that nobody could have a Bible. That the only one that was worthy to have a Bible was the Pope of Rome. And that anybody that was caught with a Bible would be executed. And this is why you had uh, many different individuals, uh, William uh, uh, Tyndale, who um, tried to copy as much of, of the scriptures as he could because it was against the law to have a Bible. And then you had um, um, Coverdale and, and different other individuals that lived in that time that um, uh, uh, some kind of way were able to get their hands on certain portions of, of, of scripture and write, writing them down and making copies of it because they had outlaw having a Bible. And I have a copy of uh, William Tyndale's New Testament version uh, that was written in his own handwriting. Um, and I think the date of that was something like 1526 or somewhere around there uh, down in, in, uh, in my library. So the popes also taught and the, the Catholic Church enforced that the only one that was qualified to give interpretation of scriptures was the pope. And even um, the pope had the authority, as they said, to make changes in the scripture. That if he felt that the scriptures were not conducive to what he thought it should mean, then he, they taught, had authority from God to make changes to the Bible. And so it was among these times that many reformers rose up and broke off from the Catholic Church and Martin Luther was the first reformer. He signed he wrote his thesis and nailed it on the uh, church uh, wall outside of the church in Wittenberg, Germany. His 99 page thesis concerning the things that he did not believe in that the Catholic churches were, or that the Catholic church or that the Rome and Vatican were enforcing. He was one of the first to realize back in that day as God was bringing the church back to its former revelation and glory that you're saved by faith. And he began to preach salvation through faith. Now, of course, this forced him out of the Catholic Church and he then uh, began his own um, denomination known as Lutheranism. And this is where the beginning of the Lutherans came about. He had different other ones, John Wesley, and Benny Fox, and John Calvin, and different these other ones. Uh, John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodist faith. These individuals broke off from the Catholic Church, and eventually denominations were formed uh, under their um, teachings. And so this is when you got all of these denominations that came about. Uh, so, but God even though that he was opening the eyes of many of those individuals, John Wesley and Martin Luther and different ones concerning um, truth that we know today, it was a gradual fashion as God was bringing the church of God out of the midst of the dark ages of which the apostolic doctrine as the apostles taught was almost completely gone. And so, uh, it was during these times that we have the developments of denominations and they are what they are today. But when Jesus came, he never came to establish a denomination. He came and handpicked his disciples, taught them, trained them for three and a half years, and then told them to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. 
And they in turn took the teachings that he, he gave to them and handed down to those that were under them. And this is the succession of how truth is supposed to be. So let's look at that. Let's go to the book of Timothy. Uh, I think we want 2 Timothy chapter number 2. And we've read the scripture uh, in time past, so it will be a first time for some and a refresher for others. 2 Peter, or I should say, oh, I said Peter. I don't know why I said Peter. 2 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse number 1. Now Paul writing to Timothy, he's writing to Bishop Timothy. Timothy was one that was trained under the Apostle Paul. He was already saved when Paul met him, highly recommended in two different cities, was all, already a minister. He knew the scriptures better than you and I were ever hoped to learn them in a lifetime of study because he was trained in the scriptures by his grandmother and his mother Eunice or Eunice as they pronounced it back in that day and Lois. But he didn't know what those scriptures meant. But it was when he came in contact with the Apostle Paul that Paul trained him and taught him and he uh, was under Paul's wing for 12 years. Now at this time he's a bishop and over the churches I believe of Ephesus. And of course Paul writes this epistle to him uh, to encourage him. So let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 1 and 2. And let's read those straight through together and then we'll go back over it. All right, let's read. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now, he says, therefore, my son, his son in the gospel. He was his adopted son because Paul basically taught Timothy everything that he knew. And of course, uh, him being under Paul for 12 years, having that experience of being trained under an apostle, under an apostle, um, he tells them, because at this time Paul is in prison, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now, as we said for over the years, there's four generations spoken of in this verse. Four generations. You have, and the things that thou Timothy has heard of me. So Timothy received his teaching from Paul. So the first generation would be who? Paul. Now where did Paul get his from? He said, I was not taught by man. He said, I received it of the Lord himself in Galatians chapter number one. Now before you think that you can get it that way like Paul get it, <laughs> you have another thought coming. That's not how it is done in our day. Man, we'll get to that in a few moments. But you have Paul who gave it to Timothy, taught Timothy, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, this thing was not done in the corner, among many witnesses, the same, the things that I gave you, the same commit thou to who? Faithful men. And that's the third generation. And then he says, who shall be able to teach who? Others also. So you have four generations. You have Paul, you have Timothy, faithful men, and the others also. So if this is followed, then the others also would be getting Paul's doctrine. Because the only thing that the faithful men are going to teach the others is what Timothy taught them. And the faithful men are only going to teach what Timothy taught them and Timothy is only going to teach what Paul taught him and Paul is only going to teach what who gave to him Jesus this is the apostolic doctrine this is how truth is handed down from generation to generation now Paul was an apostle who taught Timothy who was the bishop over the churches of Ephesus 
He was to take what Paul gave him and commit that to faithful men that would be the pastors in his diocese or under his authority. And the faithful men who were the pastors were to take what Bishop Timothy taught them and give it to the members of their congregation. And this is how God has truth preserved. And this is spoken of in two different places in the Psalms that you can read about. So you have two witnesses in the Old Testament and you have this witness right here. But it doesn't happen that way <laughs> because people want to teach what they feel is from God. And in many cases, it conflicts with what the fathers have taught. You see, the, uh, the apostles were the fathers in that day who taught their sons. He says here, thou therefore who? My son. So, if the faithful men, the pastors underneath Bishop Timothy, would teach what Timothy taught them, then the members of their congregation would be getting the teachings of the fathers because their pastor is going to teach them what their bishop taught them and their bishop is going to teach them, teach them what Paul taught him and Paul is going to teach what the Lord gave him to teach. But it's not like that today because you have, well, first of all, Bishop G.T. Haywood, who was the first presiding bishop of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the world. Um, we have gotten so far away from the fathers that when you mention the name Bishop Haywood or Bishop Paddock, people will get a blank expression on their face, don't even know who you're talking about. But if you say Noel Jones or Joyce Myers or Joel Osteen, they know who those people are. But we're talking about the fathers. Now, Bishop Haywood was of the first generation who took what God gave him and handed it down to the second generation who was Bishop Paddock who he took, who was of the second generation, and passed it down to the generation after him, who in turn took what they got and passed it down all the way to the fifth generation of which I am of right now. But unfortunately, those that received it from the fathers of the second generation only took what they wanted and diluted the doctrine that they received from the fathers and handed down to the third generation a deluded doctrine of which those and well you have the fathers that gave it to their sons and then their sons took what they wanted some of them and handed down to the third generation a deluded doctrine who in turn took from the second generation what they wanted and handed down to the fourth generation a twice deluded doctrine who those in the fourth generation only took what they wanted and handed down to the fifth generation a diluted doctrine that had been diluted three to four times. And this is why in many of our churches you have some of the most wildest and craziest teachings and beliefs among God's people because the doctrine has been diluted to the point to where they believe that homosexuals will go to heaven. To the point to where they believe that you don't have to live holy. God does not expect anybody to live free from sin. There's no such thing as living free from sin. Teaching even to the point to where holiness is not important. You do what you want to do. And that's why the church of God is in a mess like it is. And there are not going to be very many people in this generation that's going to make the rapture. It's not going to be very many people. And I have to agree with Bishop Paddock. I had a problem with this for years when he used to say this when I was a young minister. He used to say, Jesus better hurry up and come back because if he waits any longer, there's not going to be any much anything left for him to come back to. Because I believe that most of the people that are going to be in the rapture are already in their graves sleep. Because there's more people dead than there are living. And there's just going to be a few. Now, we can make it. Can we say amen? You know, we can make it. But we have to make sure that we keep the commandments of God and obey his words like we said many times. If you do these two things, you will make the rapture. Come to church, be faithful to church, and obey God's word. 
If you do those two things, you will make it. Just those two things. You can be looking up for your redemption, draw it nigh. But what are the two biggest problems that we have in the church? People being faithful to the house of God and being obedient. And if a person is not faithful to the house of God, they cannot be obedient. And then the Bible says, the disobedient shall be cast into the lake, which burneth with fire and brimstone. Yeah. And so I was talking with Bishop Johnson at the funeral, uh, which he preached probably the most dynamic funeral sermon I have ever heard. It's been a long time since I sat in the pulpit and listened to him preach. It kind of took my mind back in the days when we were down in our home church in Jackson. But uh, what we are teaching tonight is in a lot of cases obsolete because people do not want to hear what we're teaching. At our conventions, uh, at the last convention that we had, out of all of the tapes and videos and books for sale, there was only one table that had the teachings of the fathers, and that was Bishop Ira Combs' table. And there was a woman that came to that table that bought $250 worth of teachings of the fathers and of Bishop Combs. And somebody asked her, why are you buying so much? Because she says, I'm in California, San Diego, and we are starving down here. We are not getting the word. Because you can preach and teach from the Bible and not be given the word of God. You know, and that's and then there's a lot of that going on. A lot of people are starving everywhere because what the fathers received from God is not being passed on to the children. And of course, the children are left to uh, fend for themselves or believe some of the teachings of some of the leading preachers that are in the world today that are accepted by the world. Jesus was never accepted by the world. The apostles were never accepted by the world. And on one occasion, Jesus says, Whoa, when all men speak well of you. So something's wrong. Something is seriously wrong is that if you are honored at the, um, uh, at the uh, American Music Awards, if you say, you say, man, something's wrong when the world when the world embraces your preaching or the world embraces your teaching. Because you got to remember, we're supposed to be like Jesus. The world's not supposed to receive anything that we tell them. You know, you get on Facebook and you tell folk about living holy. I think I think it was Philip. Somebody told me that Philip posted online, "Is water baptism necessary for salvation?" And he got a, over like over a thousand. Comments. <laughs> you see, that don't normally happen. Of people offering their own opinions as whether or not baptism is necessary for salvation. Well, when they asked Peter on the day of Pentecost, men and brethren, what shall we do? He said, repent and be what? Baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission says you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I was talking to a minister one time and he told me baptism is not important. I said, really now? He said, no, it's just a outward act of an inward work. I said, where is that in the Bible? I said, sounds good, but where is it in the Bible? Well, it's just an answer of a good conscience toward God. I said, really, that's all it is? I said, you don't even understand what you're saying. There are men that have committed suicide because of their conscience tormenting them for the things that they've done. There have been women that have committed suicide. I knew an inmate that used to hear the cries of 23, uh, 23 kids that he slaughtered in Michigan years ago that he couldn't get any sleep because hearing the cries of those murdered children. So the answer of a good conscience toward God is baptism. That's not a light thing. Then I kind of set him up a little bit because I said, if baptism is not important, then why did Jesus get baptized? The Bible says,